Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I am your moderator, Bruce Smith, I believe is having an issue with sound. So this is Helen Horner and on behalf of AEM, welcome to the Cybersecurity Risks Reason and Response webinar. There is no question that cybersecurity is important, but how many organizations are truly prepared for this? What assets should you focus on protecting and is your company allocating enough resources towards this tactic? What threats should you be most concerned about? This live two part 90 minute webinar features multiple experts that will provide a breakdown of basics and the importance of cybersecurity in our industry. A special thank you to our member education webinar series sponsor Optimum Info and Secuvent for supporting this program. I am pleased to start off by introducing Gabriel Wayland, Manager of Information Security Solution Practice at CDW. He has previously worked in the national intelligence and security community as a counterintelligence subject matter expert and in the private sector, providing enterprise security assessments to customers in a variety of industries, including manufacturing. Gabriel is going to spend about 30 minutes with us addressing some fundamentals and key concepts in cybersecurity, and then we'll take some Q&A, um, but stick around because Gabriel will be followed by the second part of our session. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar using the chat feature, and we will address those with the speakers after each presentation. So please stay with us at the end to answer a few brief but important evaluation questions that help shape future content as well. And without further ado, let me turn things over to Gabriel. Thank you, Helen. I'm just going to swap my display and hopefully we're all set there. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am Gabe Whalen. Uh, as Helen mentioned, I am the manager of the Information Security uh, Services here at CDW. Uh, work with a team of uh, solution architects uh, to help out a variety of customers identify uh, what kind of information security solutions they want to work at. Uh, so I'm not an active hacker. Uh, I have some credentials and background in that, as, as Helen alluded to. Uh, but today, I'm excited to get to talk to you all a bit about critical asset protection uh, in cybersecurity and what that means and ways to defend it and, and some current thinking on it uh, from the CDW side of the house and, and what we've seen out there. Um, so uh, in, classic, in classic Army fashion, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell it to you, and then at the end, I'll, I'll tell you what I told you. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction, talk a little bit about what some of uh, we're seeing in, in industries as a whole uh, in terms of what they care about with cybersecurity. A little bit of orientation to the landscape. You know, for some of you, this is probably 101. Uh, for some of you, this might be some new thinking. Uh, I'll share a case study of uh, what we've seen out there in terms of some approaches to cybersecurity. Some of the current thinking that's been coming out in 2020 and 2021 um, as folks are changing their positioning around here discuss some strategies, uh, what the future might look like. Uh, I can not predict anything these days. Uh, and then also share some resources. And then uh, after the Q&A, we'll pass it over to our friends at uh, Secuvon uh, to, to follow on. So uh, as Helen uh, already alluded to, um, I have something of a unique background. Um, I uh, started my career in Army counterintelligence uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, if you know anything about counterintelligence, uh, that's this idea of chasing spies around, but in the early 2000s, there was an intersection uh, between, I'll say, classical counterintelligence and then cyber, whatever that meant, um, right? Uh, I don't even think we were talking about the dark web uh, or had that image of the, the iceberg and everything underneath it yet. Um, but it was kind of a, my first foray into that, as well as all sorts of other em emerging issues there. Um, and I got a lot of interesting exposure uh, from that career that then spanned into uh, as a defense contractor after I got out of the Army in the DC metro area, working with a variety of agencies. Um, I also have a background in forensic psychology. Um, for some reason, I thought that uh, maybe I'd go to college uh, a fifth time um, and uh, nobody wanted to pay for it, so that's hence the Army. Um, but uh, I thought I was going to be doing profiling for the FBI, and that's actually not a real job. Uh, but what's been useful from that is thinking about what drives individuals to apply security principles and also a bit about what drives uh, criminal behavior 
Um, I think probably most of us aren't surprised that it's a dollar sign, but some other some other ways to think about it. Um, I was lucky enough to be an insider threat senior official uh, for one of the contracting companies that I did work with. Uh, if you're familiar with the insider threat principles uh, working within the uh, federal government, um, after the Snowden era, um, there was uh, new requirements. Um, NISPOM conforming change 2.0 required every organization to have an insider threat senior official. Uh, in short story, that meant that I was responsible for how we managed uh, and thought about um, those those elements within uh, our organization and how we reported that. Um, so currently uh, at CDW, I manage a team of solution architects who talk every day to customers who are thinking about uh, what am I doing, whether it's a security assessment as a penetration test or incident response or something somewhere in there, or maybe something happened on the dark web. And as you can imagine, it, it's it's everything, right? There is no single vertical that we work in. Uh, we talk to everybody and we hear all sorts of different kinds of experiences out there um, in terms of what what folks are concerned about, what they're thinking about, what their approaches are and what they have to do. Um, so cybersecurity is always a lot of fun um, because it's pretty much literally everything. So with that, you know, I'll say first off, there are two approaches I think that we usually see in cybersecurity, right? On the left hand side, I still have to check that. Um, uh, on the left hand side, we see a false sense of security, right? We're doing some minimal window dressing um, to say that we're doing something. Yes, that is a type of security. Um, I think we've all uh, walked into this or uh, from at one point or another in our lives, uh, whether it's with some sort of solution that we bought off the shelf uh, or it's in an organization where we've said, really, that's uh, that's what you're doing to, to protect that. OK. Um, and and that's all it is, right? So it's just kind of waiting for someone to take advantage of it or hoping that in this case, nobody actually tests it. On the other side, uh, what we see is a uh, just a overabundance of controls and, and I'll say frequently technical controls. Um, I think we'll see a ton of that thrown at um, securing a, an asset. Uh, and in this case, uh, I think if I could count the number of bike locks there, they probably outweigh the value of the bike itself which is always a big no-no in security. Your security controls not, should not cover more than, cost more than the value of the asset that it's protecting. Um, in a lot of cases, we'll actually see both of these in a single environment. Um, we were recently having some internal conversations about um, SCADA and IoT, um, our, our, our CDW, about how we're, how we're discussing that with our customers. And um, there was this thought that everyone came from the outside, right? Um, but what we shared is frequently what happens is that on the outside, it's, it's, it's very, a very hard exterior. It's what we find inside that permits us to get uh, walk around those bike locks uh, and then walk from a corporate environment to a skater or IoT environment. Now, that's not going to apply to everyone, but my point just being that um, our, our controls not only need to be uh, appropriate to what we're protecting, but there also has to be defense in depth and then layers throughout the organization. So um, I know uh, Seth Yvonne's gonna be talking later about this today um, at, on, in terms of some of the uh, surveys that, that were shared with you all and, and your responses. Um, we did something similar in 2019. And I, I thought it was interesting just to kind of um, to position next to that um, about what our members, uh, what our customers <laughs> were concerned about, what they were thinking about in cybersecurity, what keeps them up at night, uh, what are they looking at and, and theoretically, how are they reacting to it? Um, and as you can expect, so this was 2019, uh, circa, I want to say February 2019, mid 2019. Um, so we certainly had plenty of events leading up to this, uh, but we did not have a pandemic. Um, and what were our about 500, 450 respondents to this? What are they thinking about? What are they most concerned about? And I think there's no surprise that ransomware is up there. Uh, in the upper echelons, uh, your standard malware, identity theft, data tampering, um, fraud, crypto mining and crypto jacking all the way to the bottom, which which is interesting. And I'll, I'll highlight that why a little bit later, but uh, I'll, in short, I'll just say something that we see a lot of um, out there, uh, but not necessarily top of mind for folks. Um, so maybe no real surprises here in terms of what folks were concerned with, and this is IT and C-level as well. Um, but we then said to them, well, you know, for those of you who have had a some sort of cyber incident, right? So ransomware, malware, insider threat, what have you, 
Um, within the last two years, how did your security budget change? Um, and we had asked them earlier about what we what they were planning on doing with their budget. And it was interesting because what we saw for the majority of folks was that 53% of them it stayed about the same. Uh, the incident itself did not appear to change their overall security budget or posture. Now, there's a variety of reasons that might be, right? It may be that they're still working on the analysis of why or what happened, or they foresaw it as uh, unavoidable, um, right? Maybe some of them decreased it because they were thinking about other compensating controls that they put into place. Um, but I just share that as, as a data point. I thought it was, it was interesting. You would naturally think that uh, security budgets would increase, but actually not the case um, for, for these respondents, pretty large group. So a little bit about what we actually see um, out there. And perhaps, uh, again, not some uh, big surprise to everyone, um, but we used to have this passive assessment that we, that we uh, sent out to our customers not too long ago. And it looked at their internal networks and we did some vulnerability scanning. And then we asked some questions uh, leveraging a NIST 800-53 uh, framework. And this is what we came back with was that we found active crypto mining in a majority of environments. Now, a lot of these were small business and manufacturing, uh, maybe not large corporate, K-12, definitely. Um, we saw a lot of these issues coming up, right? Active no malware, unsanctioned cloud storage. Um, things I think that, you know, we would find across the board in a lot of places. What I think is really interesting is, is are these common weaknesses? And the one I'll hone in is on the incident response plan. Um, I believe it was June 2020, uh, the IBM Ponymon study came out, uh, and they were talking about that actually organizations who had an overabundance of detection and monitoring tools for incident response were actually performing less than some of their counterparts who had fewer tools. Um, interesting report if you get a chance to take a look at it. But what really struck me was that I wanna say about 47% of those organizations did not have a cyber incident response plan. Um, and that's something definitely that we've seen uh, across the board. Um, I think there's some, some folks are maybe perhaps changing their, their, um, their outlook, uh, especially given the, what happened last year, uh, the work from home scenario, thinking about more backup plans. But that's uh, it's definitely an element that I'm kind of put stopping on here uh, as common across uh, across all verticals. For our actual security assessment team that goes out and does this work, uh, again, uh, top five vulnerability themes that you'd find, configuration management, account management, patch management. Um, you know, the takeaway here to me is that it really is these fundamentals, and I'll get a little bit back uh, in the next slide into what actors are out there. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of these fundamentals um, that are, are areas that, that present weaknesses for us. Um, and getting, getting wrapped around these are going to, uh, going to help. Um, and definitely, if not addressing these directly, having defense and depth mechanisms. I'm gonna pause there actually and talk a little bit about defense and depth. Um, so a defense and depth mechanism may be, for example, um, I once was on a client site uh, where uh, there were, it was a political consulting firm, right? Uh, had a lot of VIPs coming in and out. And, um, and I walked in and there was this beautiful lobby. Um, someone sat behind a desk um, and I just said that I had a meeting and I walked on through. Um, somebody met me, but I didn't have to present a badge or anything like that, right? Um, and then once I walked back there, um, I wasn't given a visitor access badge, but my POC came out and met me. So, you know, there was some defense there, right? Um, but then I could just walk around freely. Um, and everywhere I saw these lovely laptops sitting on desks for a, uh, somebody in this, in this realm in the DC metro area uh, who had some interesting clients. And I probably could have picked up any laptop and walked out there. And so we talked a little bit later about their visitor access policy. And uh, what they said was, well, you know, we have a lot of VIPs coming through and uh, we don't want to challenge anybody. We don't want to offend them, which makes sense. Um, they, they had thought about this. So what were they going to do then to change that? Now, maybe in that case, it was a technical control. Maybe there was something on that device so that it was encrypted. Maybe not. Uh, perhaps they have cameras in place. Uh, perhaps they decide that they're going to create a policy to have some sort of um, at least way to communicate to somebody that don't know in their environment, hi, can I help you if you don't recognize them? Uh, and if uh, given, depending on the response, then maybe they take other measures 
um, to assist in that, right? In terms of a non-confrontational visitor access policy. I like visitor access policy because I think we can all understand that. That's something that we all uh, experience in our lives, right? With piggybacking and, and being able to, to get into environments, social engineering is just, it's always the way that works. Um, but having these multitude of controls uh, through processes and not just technologies, um, I think uh, gets us further ahead and, and gives us more maturity in these in these areas. So um, threat landscape, uh, if uh, the joke maybe isn't obvious, but uh, I used a paper clip over there. I was kind of thinking about Clippy from the would you like help writing this memo back in, I don't know, the 1990s something. But we've got effectively in the in the threat landscape on the far up and right in terms of capabilities and resources, right? In terms of tools and technologies, abilities, resources, not just uh, fiscal, but also the wherewithal, the ability to develop resources, we've got those nation state actors, right? And they can pretty much do anything, anywhere. Um, and I would argue to an extent, um, sometimes um, there's a question about how much we even should worry about them. Um, if, they're really, if they're really going after a target, they're probably going to get it. Um, there are ways that we can enable ourselves. Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't. Uh, we should pretend that they're not there. But uh, there's some limitations in terms of what we can do because I don't know anyone else who has unlimited resources and capability to defend against that, uh, which sometimes seems like what it takes. Um, at the far uh, lower end, I would say, historically, this is where we saw our script kiddies, um, hacktivists, uh, low-level actors in terms of capability and resources, right? And this was probably, I'd say right here, we're probably looking at something like 10 or 15 years ago, um, right? A lot of website defacement maybe from these folks, um, people just kind of taking a spin, seeing what they can do. Sometimes people looking for a job, right? I've definitely seen that. And I think we even see some of that now where, where folks say, hey, I was able to get X uh, and now I'm letting you uh, organization know. Um, so maybe you want to hire me. Uh, that doesn't translate so well uh, as it used to, um, but it, it used to be something that, that worked back in the day. Um, and then in the middle, of course, we have our, our active criminals, right? Here, there's a case where they are going after some sort of set of targets. Uh, it may be directed against a specific organization or maybe a, a, a spray of types of organizations that have vulnerabilities, but they have a plan they have an intent and they have capabilities and they have resources to do this. Um, they, they, there is an end game in state. That's not always the case with our script kiddies. Hacktivists, sometimes, and I'll, I'll get a little bit into that next. I think a little bit about where it's moved since, uh, since the early days, right? Nation states are still where they are. Criminal entities are approaching that. And there's a couple of reasons by. Um, the bar is definitely lowered for entry into this, right? The resources and the tools um, have, there are definitely those, those that have been leaked out there. They're more widespread, they're more available. Um, it allows more organizations who previously had to cap, some, in some cases only a few had the capital, capital to buy these things on the black market. Um, now they're just freely able to get them. There may be even in some cases a relationship between the criminal organizations and the nation states. But at the end of the day, uh, highly capable, lots of resources. On the far left end, where I think we didn't have to think as much, but perhaps we want to think a little bit more about these days, um, our script kiddies and hacktivists are becoming also, likewise, becoming more capable. There's more resources available to them. Now, they may not be as subtle. They may not be as sneaky, and that may not be their objective, um, but they can cause us a whole lot of damage by kind of a death by a thousand cuts, right? Um, I think sometimes, Another place that we have to think about this is, is, is our, again, coming back to those hacktivists, right? Any type of um, issue, uh, whether that's geopolitical, uh, politics, personal, um, or in the case of, let's say, like right to repair, right? Where they are leveraging a capability to try to broadcast a message. Um, and we see that happen. And they'll use that capability because it makes a lot of noise and it lands in media. So, I wanted to, on that note, talk about hacking really quick. Um, and I generally always avoid having a person in a black hoodie in a presentation. I thought it was funny. I uh, I did a search for in our in our image library, right, of, of what we can use for presentations, and I typed in hacker. And this is, of course, what came up. Um, somebody in a black hoodie 
in a really cool warehouse, um, clearly hacking because they everything's in black. Um, and you know, something when I talk to customers, there's this idea of, well, organizations are, you know, hackers aren't interested in me um, because I produce widget X and that's it, right? That's not really interesting. And I would argue, you know, does it even really matter? Um, in terms of the criminals uh, that are doing these activities, you know, really, I would, I would argue that they're really just fishing. They don't care necessarily what kind of fish that they get. Uh, you're just going where the most types of targets are that are available. Um, you do it by a vulnerability if you're low level. If you're high level, you might have specific folks that you're targeting after a subset of folks who are who are vulnerable to uh, a, a certain uh, type of technical attack. Um, but at the end of the day, it's kind of irrelevant. And I would say that this image is irrelevant as well. Um, but it may be that I think that we need to start thinking about that cyber is just simply another means for organizations to target to get after our critical assets. It's just one way, and it's not the only way that they do it. Um, and that cyber, cybersecurity, should be a component of your overall security program. It should be one element, right? And to kind of frame that up, I'll look at insider threat. An insider uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe wouldn't have considered cyber, right? And I'm, in this case, I'm talking about a malicious insider, not an, a uh, just unaware or unintended insider. Wouldn't have necessarily considered cyber. It's too hard, high of a bar to entry to do what I wanted to get done, right? So maybe they steal some documents and leak them on the internet, or uh, they steal some documents, right, and leak them somewhere, uh, give them to a competitor, right? Now they have the ability to do more and create more damage. Um, it's, it's a different kind of case, but it's still the same actor and it's a human actor that's involved in any breach. And I think that's what we need to be kind of uh, considering. Um, one of uh, a partner I once worked with, I thought had a really interesting analogy about how they as a nation thought about this, or at least that service thought about it was, you know, they described cyber as simply, it's just an ocean. It's just another vector that they're dealing with adversaries. And rather than trying to consider the entire ocean, which then I think from uh, something that we can all appreciate, it results in kind of some, some vendor analysis paralysis in terms of making the decisions, they just looked at the battleships and submarines. They just looked at the threats that they could articulate, and then they moved on and just did the best to, to create their defense posture. And I thought that was an interesting analogy uh, that has enables us. So, uh, I wanted to share this case study, I think, that kind of in terms of how we can think about cybersecurity is something that, that was useful. Um, about a year ago, I had a conversation with a very large agricultural customer. Um, and they said to me, uh, Gabe, we did a NIST cybersecurity framework gap analysis. We didn't love it. Uh, we wanted to think, we wanted to do more. And what we really want is we want you to tell us where we should be, because we want to make a plan. Where should we be in that uh, maturity? If you're not familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, you have not only kind of your score of, are you doing this control, this technical, this physical control? Are you doing this control to secure information? But how well are you doing it? Is it is it documented, right? That's at the lowest level. I have, I have a policy I can look at. Is it repeatable? Are we doing after action reviews? Are we growing? And those are levels zero through five. Um, skipped a few in there, but you get the idea. So they wanted us to tell them where they should be. Um, and most organizations that I know in the consulting space don't necessarily like putting and telling, putting themselves quite out that far about telling somebody where they should be uh, without fully understanding their business. So, um, you know, what we said to them was, let's think about, have you thought, considered doing a business impact analysis? Have you considered where your critical assets are um, have you considered what you even want to protect, right? And it was interesting because I, I, I pulled um, one of the analysts that I work with a lot in that space uh, to have that conversation. And, and what they said was they were originally just focused on a very small part of the business. They weren't thinking about the larger business, but there were all these intricacies, right? And we started defining more critical assets. And the critical asset is something that we require to keep the business up and running and return a profit. It's what gets us out of bed every day, and it's what continues the organization tomorrow, right? So. Are there critical assets? Have we thought about the risks to those assets? Have we done much definition around that? And then on top of that, do the other stakeholders in your organization also think that the thing you think is a critical asset is a critical asset, 
right? And what does that look like, right? If we all can agree or at least have some prioritization about what we care most about, then we can defend those the most effectively. Um, so it was a great conversation uh, with that customer um, and, you know, thinking about how they might do that because we were saying, let's take that business impact analysis and at least do some thinking and definitions around, you know, where your risk lies and what you want to protect to inform where you want to be on that capability maturity uh, standing for the NIST cybersecurity framework. And quite frankly, save yourself some security budget, save some of your budget in the process and not just to try to create a meteor shield for your entire organization. Um, so our recommendations were to, you know, let's let's start thinking about an insider threat model. So I'll keep coming back to that because it's what I love. Um, at the end of the day, we have people, we have stakeholders from a variety of organizations, and it's not just IT, it's not just security. Going back to uh, that visitor access policy recommendation, it's a lot of other folks uh, who have to weigh in in terms of the defense and depth controls, and maybe sometimes even realizing that they have a dependency that they didn't know. When we have these kinds of integrated models of uh, bringing everyone to the table, um, it's not just to protect from insider threat. That's an element that we can, but we can use this model for cybersecurity and security in general, which I would say largely shares, there's a lot of shared elements. So, you know, I'm gonna jump into some current thinking, what we saw in the last, um, the last 12 months or so. Uh, if you haven't seen the Gartner 2020 Strategic Roadmap to Business Continuity Management, uh, it was a really interesting read. I recommend taking a look at it if you can get your hands on a copy. Came out in February, uh, right before right before the pandemic really went into full swing. And what Gartner said in short was that a lot of us are looking at business continuity as a purely as an IT uh, responsibility. We're purely looking at it as an IT vector. And I'm sure that most of us, um, you know, coming into the pandemic suddenly found that we had remote employees that we had to think about, uh, a whole slew of things that we, we didn't really think about. We thought about ransomware, but we didn't really think about availability as something that was going to happen on that scale. Um, and so Gartner made the argument that, you know, we need to think about it more from a business needs case. And again, um, let's bring in all those stakeholders. Um, Another element, DOD started moving into CMMC. If you're not familiar with CMMC, um, it is uh, established to protect sensitive but unclassified information. I know it's called CUI now, but SBU is what <laughs> we call this. Uh, unclassified but controlled information. Uh, but at the end of the day, they realized that there were supply chain elements that they had from their providers, defense contractors and the like, and how are they addressing those? Is it enough for an organization just to say, I'm compliant, or do they need to examine it? And so that's what CMMC is now. There's an accreditation, um, there's services all around that, um, but folks being able to actually demonstrate that they're compliant and having that certification if they wanna do business with, in this case, the DOD. And I can tell you from, I don't know, 13 or 14 years in, in the intelligence community, um, I think if DOD sees success in that space, and I expect they will, that that's gonna to continue to trickle downhill to other organizations, at least in the federal, in the federal government. Um, it was a useful approach to at least provide them some sort of um, some sort of ways of measuring their exposure. Uh, from CDW, I'll, I'll tell you, we definitely, um, I covered the entire Northeast uh, <laughs> and East Coast. We definitely saw a move to frameworks uh, from all of our customers after, uh, towards the end of 2020, uh, folks that wanted to think about more holistic security rather than just a penetration test. And then I think also we're seeing industry uh, slowly over time, but it's definitely getting into swing now is uh, movements towards real-time monitoring, right? It's one thing to say I'm SOC compliant. Uh, I have some sort of compliance uh, once and then wait a year and then tell our uh, second party or our customer, whoever is asking for it, that I'm compliant a year later. Um, but it's another thing to say I'm compliant right now. I'm compliant in five minutes. I was compliant yesterday. And we're seeing that move and that's starting to trickle downhill as well. Uh, especially as ecosystems become more integrated and and parties want to know, um, partners want to know that folks are treating uh, the information that they process on behalf of their customers or to deliver a service to their customers are also have the same security controls by the partners in their ecosystem that help them do that. And that's what's driving a lot of this, in my opinion. I think I already touched on this. What, what tends to be missing uh, that we see a lot um, Incident response, when we do see it, and I'm so happy when we do, uh, folks that have a plan, it tends to be really cyber IR. 
and it's not necessarily uh, a lot more, and that's a great place to start. But something that I think that we need to see more of is uh, a communications plan. Who can say something? Who can say to the public, here's what happened, or anything, uh, here's what happened, and here's what we're doing about, about it. Um, I think we're seeing a move towards more interest in doing that kind of stuff. What is a communication plan to our coworkers, to our employees? Uh, what can they or can they not say? Have we told them anything? Or are we just assuming that they're going to do the right thing? Have we established roles and responsibilities, not only in the technical response, but in the overall business strategic response to an incident, whatever type of incident it is? Uh, and at the end of the day, um, testing that plan, it's, it's great to have an incident response plan. Testing it and testing it and having after action reviews will go a long way. Um, I've seen that not work. I've seen that not happen uh, in organizations that were very mature and they generally wish that they had after the fact. Um, lastly, people. And I mentioned that psychology background earlier. I think we've taken a sticks approach uh, very often to uh, to the people who are our first uh, you know line of defense in terms of where they decide to click on that email or, or what have you, but they don't always have carrots to do it. And I think that's an element that's missing. And you know, here's what I'm getting at: is uh, there was an example a, a while back where somebody called into a help desk and they said, in short, I'm very important and you need to disable my multi-factor authentication token now because I have to be somewhere and I have to respond to somebody who's more in charge than you are. And that help desk person said, oh, okay, uh, Mr. Important or Mrs. Important Person, uh, let me do that for you because they're the help desk and they're there to help. And they uh, did that and um, turned out that it was a nefarious actor who had a compromised uh, username and password they will get in and dump half the global address list of that organization onto the internet, um, which had some effects, right? Um, it, was, it, was not, it was not something that they wanted out there. Um, but that individual at the help desk, I don't know, but I would suspect that they probably didn't have uh, the ability to kind of raise a red flag or a process to say, hold on a second, let me, let me check something, right? Maybe they did, maybe it happened, I don't know. Uh, but having those mechanisms that allow us to fight, especially social engineering, which has very well uh, vetted mechanisms that have worked for hundreds of thousands of years that social engineers use to this day, um, if we aren't able to fight those, uh, then we're really doing our, our coworkers and employees a disservice. Um, you know, I, I know what's coming. There's been some idea about this cyber energy star. I don't really know what that looks like. I think it's an interesting concept. Um, I think we'll see more disclosure. I, I don't think it's surprising anyone, more discourse on right to modify and liability. Uh, perhaps moves towards a formalized self-regulation. I think, um, you know, the more we hear about these um, high impact uh, attacks occurring um, and what that means in the, in the public arena and how the public is thinking about that, as well as government, um, maybe we're gonna start seeing some industries that take a move saying, you know what? like PCI DSS, well, we're gonna define this and we're gonna do it ourselves rather than somebody coming and telling us how we're going to secure it. Um, and that's what we see some happen sometimes. That's how PCI DSS, that's for credit card information, uh, if you're not familiar with it, that's how the major credit card brands uh, kind of attack the problem of fraud and credit card. Uh, similarly, I think PPD 21, if you ever heard of it, that's uh, Presidential Policy Directive 21, that tells everyone how they're gonna to respond to critical infrastructure and protect it. And ultimately what they say in that is it relies on the private sector. And I'm kind of wondering again, if we're gonna start seeing some new thought in terms of what critical infrastructure is and the ability then for government to, to kind of direct or guide some of that conversation. And lastly, um, that continues security trickle downhill in the marketplace. So I know I'm just a little bit over, uh, you know, I wanted to share some resources here uh, with you all. Uh, I really appreciate your time today feel free to reach out um, with, to me on LinkedIn or uh, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. I want to share some resources here that I, I think may be, hopefully may be useful if uh, they're new to you. So thank you all for your time today. Great, hello. Uh, my name is Bruce Smith. I'm the Director of Information Services at Grody Industries, and I am the uh, moderator of the webinar today. Sorry for those technical issues at the beginning. Uh, thank you to Helen for jumping in there and, and getting us going. So Gabe, we did get one question uh, during your presentation. It comes from Trish, 
And Trish writes, uh, you can have your ducks all in a row with cybersecurity, but what necessary precautions and requirements should your vendors follow? For example, with translation partners, uh, you may send sensitive HR documents, legal pre-production uh, or pre-product launch info, or have a government client with security concerns. Is there a checklist when vetting partners uh, to ensure that uh, they're keeping your information safe and protected? That's a great question. Um, a couple thoughts on how I would approach that. Um, so um, many of you may be aware of kind of those vendor security assessment questionnaires. Um, if it were me and I was in a position of small business, I might try and creating my own. Um, I'm just, you know, uh, make some guesses there uh, and see what's out there on the Internet. I would probably look at um, access controls, identity controls, uh, but ideally everything I could in a, let's say, NIST cybersecurity framework or 100-53. Um, there's a lot out there that you can find free resources on. I would actually recommend looking at um, CISA.gov. I suspect that you would see some things there in terms of um, vendor um, vendor supply chain and how they might want to think about that. Um, but just trying to get some sort of security framework, and we've seen I've seen this before in uh, the automotive industry, uh, where um, partners have taken um, you know various frameworks and said, "Here's the security controls I care about, and if you want to do business with us, uh, part potential partner or vendor, tell me how you do these." Now, sometimes the other element I've seen is uh, is not only in terms of having that partner or vendor um, saying if they do or how well they do meet up to the security frameworks, so NIST, ISO, um, what have you. But sometimes what I also see is a in the event you have a breach or something goes wrong, a mandatory reporting requirement um, that you will let me know within a certain period of time. Otherwise, we're not doing business with you. Sometimes when people have enough leverage, um, the ability to inspect or see the findings of that report can be useful. And a lot of times what I've seen is, frankly, this sometimes has to do with how much weight um, you know, organizations have, how much pull they have, um, and how much that vendor wants their business. But um, those are some elements that, that I would think about. Um, at least being able to ask what their certifications are, you know, if they have any, you know, did, have they gone through a, a SOC 2, uh, type 1, type 2 uh, scenario, um, what have they done uh, that you can demonstrate um, that you're having on some sort of repeatable, um, you know, timely fashion, quarterly, annually, what have you, um, and how they're meeting up to that. And then you decide if that, that meets your threshold. Okay, great. That's a great answer. Good information. That was the only question we had in the chat at this time. So thank you, Gabe. We'll move on to part two of the webinar. So let me introduce the team from Secuvant. Ryan Layton is the founder and CEO. He oversees vision, strategy, and execution efforts for the firm. Don Ainsley is the executive vice president of risk services and sales. He has built several commercial security organizations from the ground up and served more than 15 years in military intelligence and defense industries. Jim Walker is, the, is a Secuvant board member and an executive vice president with 40 years of experience in the agriculture and heavy equipment industries, recently retiring from Case IH as EVP of North American Operations. So he knows our industry intimately. Uh, so I'm going to turn uh, the webinar over to this team and let them take it away for about the next 30 minutes. Again, I would remind you, type your questions into the chat box and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Team? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Can I validate that the screen is sharing appropriately? Right now, we're just seeing your video, not the presentation. And how about now? Uh, yeah, there we go. Everything good there? OK, yep. fantastic. All right. Well, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here and uh, the partnership with AEM uh, to be able to uh, to come speak to to this group. Uh, as far as the, the presentation agenda, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to expand upon uh, what Gabe, uh, the foundation that Gabe had laid and really go into a further discussion around the cybersecurity challenge, uh, sharing a couple real world world examples that uh, that we've been intimately involved with. Uh, 
we want to move then into the uniqueness of the cybersecurity challenge in the ag ce space um, as as was introduced in, in the introductions there and we'll go a little more detail on that but with jim walker um, and his understanding of ag ce secuvant has made the focus of this industry ag and ce um, a very core core focus for us and and feel that the understanding of the industry and the business drivers within the industry coupled with cybersecurity is is the best way to approach uh, cybersecurity so that we can truly bring the right solutions and the right understanding to the industry. And we hope to be able to educate uh, a little bit on, on that. We also conducted a webinar in partnership, or excuse me, a survey in partnership with AEM. Um, in that survey, we were able to get through the server, through the members of AEM, um, some perspective and some understanding around the readiness of the, 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 the members of AEM in terms of cybersecurity. And so we'll talk through that a little bit. And then we'll close with some foundational principles for business driven cyber security. From an introduction perspective, uh, myself, uh, Ryan Layton, uh, founded Secuvant uh, back in 2014, uh, a 20 plus year um, background in information technology and business advisory services. And um, again, started when when the the industry was was really starting to, to run into the challenge. The big big companies were starting to address, uh, but it was very clear that supply chain was going to be a problem. Um, government was going to start uh, adding regulations and and a need for for assistance in kind of that where do we start, where do we go uh, type component. And so Secuvant was founded based on on those principles, with really a, a focus on business um, risk. Um, cybersecurity is a business risk, not necessarily a technical risk, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Don? Hi, I'm Don Ainsley. Uh, I think uh, Bruce did a great job getting an overview. I'll just uh, highlight that uh, my last part of my career, I was a uh, partner at Deloitte & Touche. I was hired to uh, build a security consulting practice and then eventually also asked to be the first chief security officer for Deloitte globally. Um, Deloitte's network is, uh, I think, over 150 countries and when I was with Deloitte, I think we had around 270,000 employees. Ryan? Jim? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, as as was mentioned in the introduction, I'd spent over 40 years in the ag industry, uh, but and retiring as head of Case IH North America. But probably more importantly to me and, and more applicable to this crowd is that uh, with Case IH, I was a representative for the brand uh, to AEM and was uh, privileged to serve as vice chair on the AEM board at one time and several years of chair of the Ag Sector Board. And in joining Secuvant, uh, their board in the fall of 2020, uh, my main role is the focus and the mentoring of the business in their Ag and CE channels. Ryan? Thank you so much, Jim. <clears throat> So I'm gonna I'm gonna start out. Uh, we'll start out on the on the lighter side. Um, the you know the cybersecurity challenge uh, that we deal with um, in general. Again, Gabe did a wonderful job talking about the overall challenge, and uh, really we'll spend a few minutes on the foundational challenge. And that's as long as we have people, as long as we have employees, we have a problem. We have a problem and a challenge with cybersecurity. Um, we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves. You know, the most popular password in the United States is password one, two, three. And as long as we're as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's his name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. It's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. So Jolie, six, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. 
but we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's it's only three, but it's, you know, it's uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma. One, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so, what? like, like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah. Now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the important thing is he learned a uh, terrible lesson. So anyhow, a little bit on the lighter side, um, but it really it really goes to show that when we're we're trying to address the cybersecurity cybersecurity challenge, we really have to manage to the weakest link, and the weakest link in this case is always going to be uh, our, our our humans or our employees. Um, Ninety percent, ninety one percent of cyber attacks. Um, our uh, the study of from from Trend Micro uh, showed that 91% of cyber attacks um, were were initiated through uh, spear phishing emails. And again, it's leveraging it's leveraging the employee, leveraging the emotional side um, of, of things. That social engineering concept. So we're going to talk through. Um, I want to talk through and, and kind of move into two examples that we've recently been a part of that were both initiated through this type of a this type of a means. Uh, the first one is a cyber extortion example. The next one that we'll go through is a is a ransomware example. Uh, but this first example, it's a privately held industrial manufacturer of about 500 employees or about 200 million dollars in revenue. Uh, they had a, a modest, um, you know, a modest uh, cybersecurity posture, hadn't been breached before, um, and as such didn't uh, had some of the basics, but didn't have things like cyber insurance, didn't have uh, didn't have monitoring or detection in place and and had, had been OK thus far. So um, we personally, th these guys were a prospect of, of ours and in one morning at 5.55 a.m. Um, we received an email and the email was the client forwarding an email that they had received um, from a hacker and the email basically said that we've got your social security numbers of 959 employees. We've got proprietary designs of your clients um, that we know who's which designs they are and who they're for and are willing and ready to notify them that we have those in our possession. And oh, by the way, to ensure that you understand that this is legit, here are the social security numbers of four of your top executives. The next morning, the well, I'll take a step back. Obviously, uh, a, a lot of reaction and trying to figure this thing out um, over the next 24 hours um, as they were trying to sort things. Uh, the next morning at 6.45 a.m., about 24 hours later, they got a follow-up email. And the follow-up email was basically the same hacker saying, um, where, where, where's the communication? Um, just so you know that I still own your environment. Here's a summary of what your executives were up to um, based on their email activity. Um, even as bold as saying, tell your executives to stop golfing and start paying attention to my demands. And then furthermore, provided the salaries of the executives in the same email and, and then further demanded the ransom. So the uh, on the previous slide, what they were asking for was the, the hacker basically said, I'll take all this information, I'll get rid of it, I won't do anything with it so long as you pay me $150,000 in Bitcoin. Um, after uh, several days of negotiation and working with the, with the hacker, um, they ended up paying 100K in Bitcoin. Um, the company ended up having to legally notify every single one of their clients. They actually lost two large government contracts. Um, they didn't have any cybersecurity so, or insurance, so they ended up having to pay for the whole thing out of pocket. And they estimate that the total loss of this event was approximately a million dollars. I'm going to ask Don to talk through um, the, second, the second example, uh, which was a ransomware breach. Um, Don? Hey, thanks, Ryan. The, the next uh, example that we wanted to talk about is a, we have a, um, a company that's in the hospitality industry. They're about uh, 1.9 million billion in revenue. Uh, they previously had a breach in, in, uh, a few years back, and the damage to that was about 150,000. Um, their governance structure, they have a corporate CISO. However, the regions uh, operate autonomously. 
And uh, I would say that there's, they, we have down their securities moderate. Um, I would probably say it's pretty, it's less than moderate. They have firewalls, they have antivirus, that's about it. Uh, but they don't have any monitoring and detection availability. They're only doing that in North America. Uh, the breach occurred. Uh, we got notification from the IT folks that users uh, couldn't get access to the information. Uh, then we got a message from uh, an organization called Sodimoco. Uh, they're uh, an organization out of China, whereas the previous example that Ryan talked about was, uh, was not a professional one. Uh, this is a professional organization. They're all set up just like a normal uh, organization. They have a help desk to help you through the, the mitigation process and restoration process. Um, and what happened is that all the backups uh, were fully encrypted, so we could not get access to any of the information. We we're able to stand up the crisis management uh, team within about uh, 30 minutes, and we we're able to manage through that event for uh, about four weeks. Next slide, Brian. And some of the uh, challenges that we, we found uh, was that um, that there was uh, concerns about how to communicate with uh, the, the community, whether it's the users uh, being employees, whether it's being uh, a client, uh, what do they say? And the other challenge we were running into is that the IT staff that um, you know were part of one of the individuals in the IT organization that actually linked, uh, clicked on the link uh, that initiated the encryption uh, event, um, they started trying to mitigate and trying to work through the problem, whereas we had a ransomware initial response company that was actually doing the forensics investigation. So there was some um, friction there that we had to work through over time. It was interesting, though. We stood up the crisis management team. We met for uh, two times each day for about four weeks. Um, and um, worked through the issue. We're able to get things up and running, back up and operating within uh, two and a half weeks. Uh, we ended up uh, paying two and a half, or 2.2 million. Uh, initially, I think the request was around four, just north of four million dollars. And uh, then the forensics company was paid about three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and the company paid a uh, hundred thousand out of their deductible for the cyber insurance. Um, and the if you look at the cost. The out of uh, being out of business, the restoration costs, and then the mitigation costs, you can see the number here, it's quite staggering. We're looking at north of approximately $25 million that the companies have to pay in addition to what the cyber insurance company paid, right? Thank you. So, you know, two, two, two unique instances, um, somewhat related. There were some commonalities between, between each of the breach. As I said before, in both cases, the common entry point was targeted spear phishing um, in either company. Uh, and we find this a lot of times in the industrial kind of manufacturing space that unless you're a, a very, very large company, the, the role of IT operations and security generally is a shared role. And that was the case in each of these organizations. Uh, the networks as such, the networks were designed for function um, more so than for security. Um, uh, mis there was misplaced security. There, there, in some cases, there was investment in security, but not necessarily aligning to the business risk that was most most important to the company. We'll talk about that a little bit more in, in greater detail. Uh, in both cases, there were incident response plans, but failure to test and to update in the in the recent future. And and again, yeah, each lost clients and dealt with uh, significant legal liability concerns, um, both post contract and excuse me, post breach and and during the breach um, and so you know just again significant challenges and these are these are not these are not isolated events we see these types of things you know unfortunately every day um, all day long so the the challenge and let me let me say one other thing one, one thing that we we really try not to do is um, you know, the, I'm I'm, cons I'm concerned personally in the industry that that the cybersecurity or the, the security industry is really um, it's smoke and mirrors, or it's 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 more of trying to sell the fear. That's kind of the approach that a lot of the vendors take, and and so I, you know, we share these examples, not not from the the standpoint of, of fear or or to try to to create this. Um, 
uh, I guess the sense of urgency that, that doesn't need to be there. Um, we share it because it's a, it's a problem and it's a challenge that we're seeing significant um, circumstances where businesses are going out of business. Um, and, and we just want to guard against that and, and make sure that we're just talking, talking the facts and the truth of what we're seeing in the industry. But the problem and the challenge is going to continue to increase. Um, if you look at the bottom three bullets of this, of this slide, uh, the the uh, the dollars that we're talking about in cybercrime represents the greatest transfer of economic wealth in history. It's exponentially larger than the damage inflicted from the natural disasters in a, in a given year. And um, the last one, it, it will be more profitable than global trade of all major illegal drugs combined uh, by the time we get to year uh, 2025. And so you look at that $10.5 trillion number um, by year 2025, it's just a substantial number it's a substantial problem and that we need to work together to, to try to solve. And um, Ryan, let me just interject real quickly. I think that we're finding ourselves coming out of uh, a pandemic and we're coming, we're into, a, we're in another pandemic. And so I would say that the ransomware events and some of the uh, issues that we're seeing, our clients are seeing in the marketplace is that this is a real, real, real issue that the government and uh, businesses need to get their arms around. Okay, thanks, thanks, Don. Completely agreed. So then, let let's. How does this translate now into the ag CE industry? And we want to we want to shift the presentation to be more specific around ag CE um, as it pertains to each of you um, uh, within within your your specific space. So within the within the ag CE space, obviously there's a massive digitization that's happening in the ag CE industry. If you look at ten years ago versus where things are at today, the ability to utilize the technology that are available, whether it's um, IoT, whether it's OT, IT integration, um, the advent of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and the development now of 5G. It's giving us the ability to be that much more connected across the board. And with this, as this innovation continues to progress, obviously the securing of that innovation needs to happen, but the securing is obviously going to lag. If you look at some of the benefits of digitization in general, uh, whether it's smart manufacturing, manufacturing, predictive maintenance, uh, client connectivity, those are all areas that provide differentiation and competitive advantage. And, and, and in this industry specifically, um, that land grab of leveraging this technology to be able to differentiate is a no-brainer, but it obviously comes at a cost. Um, and this industry is slightly behind some of the other industries that have been regulated for several years or that have been very, very reliant upon, upon digital, uh, you know, the digitization or digital technology. The other thing, and, and Gabe talked about this a little bit uh, previously, but there's expanding federal and state regulatory requirements. Uh, Gabe talked about CMMC. Uh, DFARS is another regulation that's out there that's, that's targeting uh, DOD providers. And then we're starting to see laws that are popping up in, in almost every state now, um, it, whether, whether, um, whether it's either ratified or, or at least being introduced as bills within individual states. Laws around data, data privacy and cyber cybersecurity are popping up everywhere. The last I read, I think it was 25 plus states had had some type of bills, uh, bill that was being discussed within their legislative session around this. The other thing that we're seeing is that the Ag CE client is becoming more informed. And with that, uh, there's a there's a data point that we'll talk about in the in the survey results. But as they're becoming more informed, they are having greater expectations on how their data should be handled. Uh, one of the one of the the, the question that was asked in, in the in the first half of the presentation was about third party vendors. It's a very astute question and that's exactly what's happening. The buyers are starting to get wiser, they're more informed and they have greater expectations of those that are providing services and those that are handling their data. And, and we think that's so we think that's a great move. But but these these are are significant changes in, in the recent years opposed to what what things looked like, you know, five, six, ten years ago. The result of that then is the industry's past, our, our perspective then is the industry's past experiences with cybersecurity risk can't be representative of the future. We can't make future decisions um, on, on how we invest and protect our businesses from cyber risk based on what's happened in the past because the landscape has changed, things have changed. 
so what we've what we've set out to do um, as a company in partnership with 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 uh, uh, AEM um, and, and others is really understanding in greater detail the readiness of the AXCE space uh, for the cybersecurity challenge. And so two things we wanted to do is we wanted to to obtain clarity as to the readiness, and we wanted to establish a baseline for future benchmarking in the AXCE space. And so what we did is we in partnership with three of the associations, AEM um, representing the the manufacturers in the AXCE CE space, EDA representing the agricultural dealers, and then AED representing the construction equipment dealers. And we did conducted surveys for each of these three organizations. We're going to focus specifically on AEM, but the the you know the feedback that we were able to receive um, through each of these gave us some real good and unique insight into into the ag CE space. So I'm going to go through a couple of those uh, you know maybe five six uh, questions that that came uh, that came through the survey uh, to to frame. The, the you know the final uh, direction of the presentation. So firstly, uh, for for AEM, um, this was directed at the C level uh, C levels uh, within AEM, and when you look at the the distribution, it really was uh, almost split evenly between construction and agricultural, with uh, mining and utility making up the making up the the remainder the remainder. Um, <clears throat> we asked we asked two. You know, two key questions here um, that that we felt there was a real strong correlation. The first question was the likelihood of a cyber of the likelihood cyber risk is being addressed in an executive meeting. And what we found is just a little over 60% responded that likely or very likely that this topic is being discussed with executives. And if you compare that to one of the other questions we asked, which was um, which of which of your organizations has had a past experience with a cyber incident? We had 66% that had some sort of an incident, whether it was um, a major, a minor, or, or a crippling event. About 66% had had, and and there's no there's in, in, from our perspective there's really a, a great correlation when the in, uh, the incidents happen there's obviously the dialogue when the incidents don't happen there's generally not the dialogue and in the cases that there are maybe the occasional conversations it's generally because of what you've either seen on the news um, you know a peer that has been that has been impacted but it really hasn't hit home yet there's other priorities other areas of focus. Second question, uh, or the second thing to, to point here is um, in asking the question of what is the most important asset for for AEM members, and and by far and away it was the data, right? The the data the data is king. It's all about the data, and then we asked the question if breached, how were you breached? And the three primary areas that came up was um, whether it was an extortion or or, or kind of a theft of of data assets. That were then sold on dark web. It was uh, it was quite frequently wire fraud uh, transfers, um, and then and then uh, ransomware by far was was the greatest. And if you look at each of those three areas, each of them deals with data, but it deals with data in different ways. The first is data theft, and and I, I believe I believe Gabe talked about this a little bit earlier. That there's a lot of times from executives that we get the question, we don't have data that anybody would care about. Why would they care about the data? That may or may not not be true, um, but when extortion comes into play, all of a sudden that data, it may not be valuable to the client, the data itself, but what they're doing with the data is valuable. So extorting you, now there's monetary value to them. Data misuse is a perfect example of wire fraud where they're taking data, they're getting access to data, and they're using it for their own purposes. They're not using the data, but they're using it for their own purposes to, to do, you know, to manipulate the system. And then ransomware, is all about data access or I should say inaccessibility. Uh, the example that Don talked about was when when that that client uh, was breached, they were out for two and a half weeks and the reason they were out is they could not get access to their data. Uh, the process of, of negotiating with the ransomware company um, took about uh, probably five, six business days for that. Uh, well, to calendar days for that to be to, that to be completed. Then they had to go through the process of decrypting hundreds and hundreds of servers and workstations to be able to get to that data. And so, for them, the ransom. The ransom that was paid was minimal and frankly it was covered by the insurance company. For them the greatest impact was their inability to access and use the data to conduct their operation. 
the next the next uh, slide here is uh, we've tiled the kind of confidence bias uh, in, in the Ag CE space. We asked three questions and as you go from left to right, each question is a, is a layer deeper in specificity. Uh, the first question, companies with a high level of cyber security maturity, 78% um, of the respondents um, responded mm -hmm. that they felt that they had a high level of cyber security maturity. The second question was the confidence in their cyber security preparation and that level dropped from 70 down to 69%. Um, the last question, companies that believe that they have a capable IR plan um, was 62%. And you go back to the question that uh, Gabe had talked about this as well, the incident response readiness. Incident, incident response readiness is a very specific question and it should be absolutely 100% aligned with the first question of the, your maturity. If you are, if you don't have an IR plan, you do not have the cybersecurity maturity that you need as an organization organization. Those percentages should be identical. And what we found typically is the deeper we get in questioning, the deeper we we get to the truth. And the truth is there's a lot of things that have to be in place to truly be protected in cybersecurity. Now, an, an, an interesting thing I shared that we had also done the survey of AED and AEM. Uh, so th this is an example, the exact same question from the dealer, from the dealer perspective, um, the dealers that are representing the different products that, uh, that you know, the AEM members uh, likely sell. But the same type of, you know, very, very similar. But what we did is we broke this out into, we had the ability Ability to divide the data into greater than 150 million in revenue and smaller than 150 million dollar revenue and you see the disparity in in organizations those organizations that are less than 150 million are nearly 50 percent less um, secure in terms of their maturity their preparation and their incident response plans and um, you know we think we think that probably we've seen that in other areas and in other industries we just didn't have the data the, the data split to be able to share that uh, based on AEM, but would assume that those data points would, would fall. The other thing that, that you see in both surveys, if you go back to the previous slide and then now this slide, that again, the percentage of confidence is dropping. And what we've typically found is as we get more specific, the, the probability of, of, of true security is less. And when we go in and when we do risk assessments for our clients, I would say on average, we're seeing that the actual security readiness is probably 50% of what the executive team generally feels. And that's not the case in every scenario, but I would say on average, that's typically what we've found. Uh, two final slides on the on the on the statistics here. Uh, this one is the question was asked of which external drivers are having the greatest influence on cybersecurity initiatives, and we really gave we were trying to identify in four areas. Obviously, the hackers, what's going on in in, in the threat landscape is is a big thing, but we wanted to determine if the other external drivers, whether it's dealer security, whether it's supply chain for the manufacturers, whether it's their customers, or whether it's regulatory requirements and and, and uh, your peers within the within the AEM membership uh, really 70 percent uh, believe that the external primary external drivers drivers are customers and and regulatory requirements and again that goes to the point that the customers are becoming more savvy uh, they have greater expectations uh, before they invest in a partnership they want to make sure that data uh, controls are in place and that they're not being put at risk because of failed security within within their supply chain the final the final uh, survey slide is the top three business risks impacted by cyber. Now, Secumite has a number of, of clients that are in the Ag CE space, um, whether it's the manufacturer side or the dealer side. But what we typically see in this industry, um, we ask that we have a methodology that we go through with clients uh, to help them identify what the top prioritization is in terms of existing business risk so that we can map cyber risk back to those business risks that they're already managing to. And and, and almost like clockwork, uh, this would be the the, the rank order that, uh, that that comes in. Guarding against uh, data or IP theft is number one. Um, minimizing business disruption, number two, and then protecting your organization's brand and reputation, number three. Now, if we were to ask dealers, we would probably see business disruption as number one, and data theft would probably be down to number three. Generally, the dealers are really concerned about brand and reputation because of how tightly they're tied to their manufacturers. Um, but this would be this is this is what we see across the board um, and the survey results validated what we see on an individual assessment basis.
So where do we where do we go from here? Um, navigating the maze is, is the challenge, and and the the state of the the industry is the state of the industry. Every single organization is at their own their own space. Some are more mature, some are less mature. Some are starting out, some are trying to improve. Regardless, it's a maze and it's very, very difficult when you look at the industry and the confusion in the industry. And the trick is, how do we step over the confusion and get to the point that we're out of the maze and more working on things that foundationally strengthen our posture? And the from, from our perspective, um, and we'll finish the presentation off with this, is the perspective really is that we have to focus on fundamental principles of business-driven security. It has to be driven from a business perspective first and not from a technical perspective. Um, if we don't do that, we're going to find ourselves missing, uh, misaligning um, our, our risk mitigation efforts. We're going to find ourselves overspending on areas and, and, and giving into the hype of, of what, you know, what the, in our opinion, what the vendors are really trying to drive in the industry. So uh, going through, uh, there's six principles to, to go through very, very quickly. Number one is any organization, regardless of size or vertical, is a potential target. Um, as long as there's data and as long as we're leveraging technology, you are a target. The tool sets that the, the, the industry has, um, or the hackers have, is, is so advanced now that, that they can do minimal work themselves and still get maximum value, uh, regardless of the size or vertical. Um, of, of a specific target. Secondly, second principle is cybersecurity risk is a business risk and it's not a technical risk. What we've, what we've, we feel so strongly about, um, and I appreciate Gabe bringing up the, the business impact analysis. When I started Secuvant, I felt it was very, very critical that we had to put a model in place that was focused on business risk, not technical risk. If you look at the chart on the right, a lot of organizations would, would approach cybersecurity from right to left. Let's start with, with looking at the operational risk, the tactical security risk, and start moving left. We feel so, so strongly that it has to start with the understanding of the business mission and goals of an organization, and then work to align the existing risks that you're already managing to with the types of controls that, uh, that are available that we can put in place. And so we've got we've got a process that we follow, we call it the Secuvant Cyber 7, but there's seven key areas. Six of these are risk areas, and one of them is more of a business enablement. And as we sit down with executive teams, um, we're able to really work with them to identify what the top areas are of focus for them. And now we can build entire cybersecurity programs around the prioritization that they've driven um, or that they've instructed us to, to follow. Uh, third is that there are diminishing returns in cyber risk management. <clears throat> um, if you look at the, the, the risk curve, we can never get risk to zero, yet we can spend dollars unlimited uh, unlimited dollars on trying to reduce risk. And and so the the approach here, the, the principle here is we have to find where the optimal investment is um, and then not go beyond the optimal investment. This is a really hard this is a really hard area to find. And, and and what we found is the best way to get to that optimal is we have to have it be business driven. If we can align with the business in every way and have the business priorities drive our cyber risk initiatives, we're going to have a greater likelihood of aligning risk and costs within the organization. And uh, it's just a critical piece because again, we'll never get to zero in terms of risk. Um, we want to know when it's time to start transferring risk uh, or assigning risk rather than continuing to try to mitigate. Uh, number four is successful risk management needs to be done programmatically. A lot of times, if it's a if it's a breach, um, uh, if if a company approves budget for for initial cybersecurity, a lot of times we see that cyber is is approached more as a project. We get X in place and then we move on, and and we just. It, 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 there are so many that the landscape is changing, the threat landscape is changing, uh, the risks are changing, the business is changing. Um, for example, there's pandemics, pandemic that changed the whole business landscape for every organization on the planet. Those are things that have to be understood. Um, we have to manage them programmatically um, or, or we'll miss the boat. Uh, implementing metrics to measure and align cyber risk to business risk 
is is another key another key thing. We can't improve what we're not measuring and we can't align what we don't understand. And so implementing metrics to align um, to align cyber risk to business miss, business risk is critical. Every organization is different and what we typically find is based on that 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 Secubant 7, that prioritization that businesses have um, for their business, it may drive differing um, risk levels. If brand and reputation is your number one priority, then crisis management and communication preparation is absolutely critical. Um, how you communicate to the employees, how you communicate to the press, and how you communicate to your clients and partners in the event of a breach is absolutely critical as we go through that as we go through that process and so again identifying what are the levels of risk um, that we need to measure put those measurements in place and then manage to those metrics over time Don I'm going to have you take the, the the final the final item here thanks Ryan I think yeah the, the, the last bullet that we have here cybersecurity begins with the executive leadership and I will tell you that uh, you know, Deloitte, uh, when I became the first CSO and also doing client service, I was a little surprised that, you know, we really had nothing in place. And this is a, you know, at that time was a $38 billion organization. So we had to really take the executive leadership team on a journey. Uh, part of the challenge I found in the industry is that there's a lot of cybersecurity folks that are out there talking from a technology standpoint. Uh, they're talking also from a regulatory standpoint. And it, it's, it's very confusing for the executive leadership to really to understand where do they need to begin. And so I think they need to take a step back and we need to take uh, and enable the an executive leadership team to really understand and learn more around cyber risks, learn about uh, the cybersecurity um, in, in the environment. And that's really that. Next slide, Ryan. Yes, thank you. Um, and then the other thing is that I think, you know, no matter what we're doing today, uh, as far as what the requirements are, the things you got to do today are no different than what we we're doing before. So you need to have the basic blocking and tackling in place, no matter what the regulatory requirements are. You need to start with that, have a good foundation, and build towards and have a plan that over time you can meet those uh, those requirements. So it's going to take time, and we need to make sure that the cybersecurity strategy aligns with the business strategy. So there needs to be an understanding of where the business is going. What the key strategies is? It, is it digital? Is it a digital initiative? What it might be? And are you prepared to uh, respond to? Uh, I used to say the unlikely event that there's going to be a breach. Now uh, I would tell you that the it's going to be the likely event, uh, and rather than the unlikely event that there's going to be a breach. So there's going to be a breach. You need to make sure that you're prepared, that you can detect, and you can respond to a cyber attack when it does occur. So you have some good monitoring in place. You have a good cybersecurity. Uh, crisis management plan, incident response plans that are in place need to be simple and to the point that allow you to manage through a crisis when it does occur. And then also, you're also the weakest link. We used to say before that, you know, inadvertent or advertent uh, employees doing something. Well, that was, you know, used to be maybe 70, 80 percent. Well, now we're seeing it uh, close to 90 percent of the threats are related to internal. So we need to make sure that your security education awareness program is robust and there's metrics that are reported back to the executive leadership team. Ryan? Okay, great. So in, in conclusion, right, the, you know, the, as Don, as Don was alluding to, uh, as C, uh, CISO of Deloitte, some of the key questions that he was continually asked by the board is, do we have an understanding of the threats and risks in an organization tied to cyber, the frameworks that we're using, the strategies that we're aligning with, um, are we prepared to direct or detect and respond? And how do we prepare our employees to play a role in this process? And so our, our recommendation, you know, for, for your consideration would to take as you, uh, I, I'm sure in a lot of cases these discussions are happening, uh, but take these discussions and, and really build, uh, build strategies and next steps around answers to these questions as to where you're at and, and, and where you need to go. Um, Jim, do you want to finalize? Yeah, I think that, you know, it, uh, the things that we certainly have found out from the survey of the of the manufacturers of the current state of cybersecurity is one thing. But when you tie those together with the dealer surveys and discussions we've had, the clients we have behind us, I, I think that the risk management services that uh, Secuvant has established are those that are focused uh, on the AG and CE manufacturers, suppliers and dealers. Um, of all sizes. 
So I think that's the important thing. One size does not fit all. And I think this is a capsule of the offering of the products that have been um, you know, developed for the Ag CE line. Uh, but again, it's for all size dealers, manufacturers, and suppliers. Okay. So that's, that's our presentation uh, for today. Bruce, I'll turn it back to you with any questions. Great. Well, you guys did a, a great job, uh, so much so that we did not get any questions from the participants, <laughs> but you're not going to get off the hook that easy because I actually have a couple uh, very interesting uh, information regarding breaches. Uh, I was wondering how should companies in our industry think about uh, the cryptocurrencies in regard to our incident response plan? And then secondarily, do you have any statistics or uh, uh, perhaps thoughts around what percentage of breaches could be prevented just with some basic cybersecurity hygiene like has been discussed today? Yeah, why don't, uh, Don, maybe you be thinking on the on the cryptocurrency. Um, yeah, the, I, I'll tell you, that, so the ransomware uh, is being paid in uh, a Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency. That's how the, those are being paid, so they're not, it's not trackable. Um, so that's just, for future notice or uh, just if, if something does occur, they're going to have to pay it that way. Yeah, so I think that the anonymity of of, of uh, cryptocurrency is, you know, is the is the thing. There'll be lots of information that continues to come out. Um, you know, we've had we've we've had um, over the years, uh, we've had companies that are are cryptocurrency companies that are are large investments that are coming into to standing up cryptocurrency um, organizations um, to manage that that are really trying to address. Do we even want to get into this business because of the the, the risk or the security risk of things? And so I think you're going to see a lot of information continuing to come out um, on the security um, of 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 things in, in in that in that world but to don's point absolutely uh the the anonymity of of cryptocurrency bitcoin is the is the de facto way that, that most of these hackers are receiving payment again because it can't be tracked um i think you know, to answer the second question i'll start there ryan and you can maybe come in i i don't know what the percentage i would say but i would say if not all of them obviously but a majority of them would be uh, would not occur if you had the basic hygiene in place. If you had monitoring in place, uh, so your network's being monitored. If you look at, like, for example, your alarm system that you have in the house, you have that same alarm system on your networks. networks. The other piece I would say security education awareness is critical. Making sure your employees are aware and, and you have a program in place to start to educate them and you have metrics of reporting to the senior leadership. And you'll see in the one, the, the second case study that we had that the network segmentation so that, you know, they were, so the way the network was designed in Asia was all one giant network. If they had segmented that way, it should have been done from a security standpoint. We had Asia, Australia, and New Zealand would have been segmented. So you could have broken that out and minimize your risk. And then obviously, that you know, they had a crisis management capability in place with their headquarters organization, but it really wasn't really baked into the organization within Asia. So I think to answer your question, a majority of these events can be prevented um, if you have good hygiene in place and you have your employees, they have a good security awareness program. Okay. Yeah, Don and I would I would just add absolutely add to that is, and it goes back. Uh, Gabe showed a slide. Um, that was very similar to this around patching, around configuration man management. Some of the basic best practices around um, just just system hygiene. Um, if you take care of that, if you take care of the employee training and get the culture of, of the employees right within the organization and have them take ownership of your security plan as well and your security execution, um, I think most security practitioners would state that that, that will, it, it's not, it's not uh, 100%, but it will, it will go a very, very long way in reducing the risk uh, to, to each of our businesses. Yeah, and Gabe, Gabe brought up a good point, and you know, Ryan also talking about the patch management. So you look at your antivirus, you look at your, uh, your firewalls, you look at your application, all of those need to be patched on a reoccurring basis. So it's not just a matter of having your firewall sitting there, your antivirus up and running, and then you don't have to touch it. It constantly needs to be updated and so do your applications. So if they're not patched, there's vulnerabilities that are can be exploited within those applications. Great, that was great information. So uh, there are no other questions. So at this time, I'd like to tell uh, Ryan, Don, Jim, and Gabe, thank you for sharing 
your uh, expertise with us today. It was it was really good. Uh, I really hope all of you joining us walked away with some practical information. Uh, as our industry becomes increasingly digital, cybersecurity becomes increasingly important to us. Uh, and thank you to all those of you who participated. Uh, please visit the events page of our website for a full lineup of the members uh, series. And uh, right now, uh, Helen actually put a reminder in the chat. If you don't have the chat box open already, please go there. We'll have a couple of brief questions. It takes less than a minute to complete these. Uh, these are very important to our education and content uh, team as they use these to uh, shape future programming. So thank you again to our sponsors, Optimum Info and Secuvant. Uh, that completes today's program. We wish you a safe and pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.